6.8.6 uh, million people are displaced. Uh, 1.8 million are out of Sudan, while almost uh, 6.4 are inside Sudan displaced. Um, one year later, and as our colleague Thai had explained, a lot has um, has has, uh, has has changed in terms of the situation getting worse. Uh, we have uh, a health system that is not able to provide adequate services to its population. You have a lack of supplies of medical equipment. You have you uh, staff or uh, medical staff who are displaced, and some are inside the country, some are outside the country. We are talking about a situation today that uh, almost 17.7 .7 million people are in need of food assistance, while uh, over 700,000 children are at risk of being malnourished. Um, the humanitarian consequences of the war is dire. It has uh, affected the infrastructure in terms of water supply, in terms of electricity, but worst of all, the people engagement in livelihood and food production, which has both uh, impact now and impact in the future. Uh, we are also looking at an infrastructure that has already been, uh, you know, de de destroyed. Some uh, areas that are functioning at a very minimum rate, including that of Sudanese Red Crescent, where the headquarters vehicles have been looted. So they're operating in a very challenging environment. However, the Sudanese Red Crescent Society has mobilized over 40,000 volunteers. Uh, 3,000 are working at the, uh, concurrently throughout the 18 states. Uh, since the war started, the volunteers have been working round the clock, uh, and these are volunteers that are coming from the community that they serve. Uh, they've been providing food services, health care, uh, provision of clean water, uh, support with uh, dead body man, uh, burial of, uh, of dead body, use, ensuring that they are buried in a dignified way and able to be identified when the need arises. Um, we are also looking at a situation where children uh, right now are, are being uh, supported, of course, in some area, but a number of them are at very high risk, as I explained. So far, the figure given is over 700,000, and with the time, it will even get worse. Uh, the Federation, the Sudanese Red Crescent, are calling upon um, the, the all parties in Sudan uh, to sit and reflect, reflect on the challenge and humanitarian challenges that the war has caused, because despite any support that will be mobilized or the current uh, humanitarian support that will be have been mobilized, which is at like 10 percent of the total required resources, uh, um, nothing will uh, will be able to 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 fill these gaps if the root cause is not addressed. So. It is calling upon uh, all parties to deeply reflect on the humanitarian challenges the action has taken, and to look at the greater nation and how to be how to be able to address these humanitarian challenges through at least ensuring that the ceasefire is, is called for and people sit in dialogue to minimize, avoid, and 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 and, and uh, ensure that the Sudanese uh, who are currently suffering both inside Sudan and outside Sudan are uh, able to move back to the normal way of life and to move back to where the homes are and to start rebuilding their country. So as International Federation of Red Cross and the Red Cross Red Crescent Movement, we are calling upon all parties to sit down for the sake of humanity, for the sake of the people and the children that are suffering, so that we can be able to together sit down and look at the ways of recovering and ensuring that uh, the, the community, the families are able to recover from the crisis that have almost taken one year to uh, to date. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Stay with us for the question and answers. And I'll go to Christian now for an update from WHO on Sudan. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, time is running out. Without a stop to the fighting and unhindered access for the delivery of humanitarian aid, Sudan's crisis will dramatically worsen in the months to come and could impact the whole region. We are only seeing the tip of the iceberg, and the situation could be much more dire in reality. Access for humanitarian actors is particularly constrained, as has been reported so many times by all of the colleagues. Half of the states are not accessible from within Sudan. Darfur and Kolovan are inaccessible and cut off from human Dr. Tedros will take part in the Sudan International Human Day Conference. Now, a, a few key figures, and yes, I will share those afterwards in my notes. Every second person, or 25 million people, are in need of humanitarian assistance this year. 
this is 9 million more than last year. 15 million people are in need of urgent health assistance. An alarming 18 million of people are facing acute food insecurity, that's IPC uh, 3 plus, with 5 million people on the brink of famine in areas affected by the conflict. With the lean uh, season expected to start soon and without unhindered access for aid, the situation will only worsen in the coming months. 3.5 million children, that's every seventh child under five years, is acutely malnourished. 230,000 children, pregnant women and new mothers could die in the coming months due to hunger unless urgent life-saving funding and aid address their needs. And that's according to Save the Children. 70 to 80% of the health facilities are not functioning due to the ongoing conflict. Attacks on healthcare during the war have left more than 25% of all hospitals non-functional. 62 attacks have been verified by WHO only the last year, resulting in 38 deaths and, and, and 45 injuries. Um, medical supplies in the country are estimated at about 25% of the need. And for several months, there has been a general crisis in medical supply at all levels of the health system with increasing drug prices and depleted pharmacies. This means that people suffering from diabetes, hypertension, cancer or kidney failure experience and even die from severe complications due to the lack of treatment available. Some states, such as Darfur, have not received medical supplies for the past year. Disease outbreaks are increasing in the face of disruptions of basic public health services, including vaccination, disease surveillance, functions of public health laboratories, and rapid response teams outbreaks uh, as we see them of over 11,000 cases of cholera, over 4,600 cases of measles, 8,500 cases of dengue, 1.3 million cases of malaria, and so on and so forth. Time is running out. Indeed, Christian, and thank you very much for uh, this update on the health side. And I just would like to add, as as <clears throat> sorry, as Christian has uh, reminded on Monday, uh, also the Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Joyce Musuya, will also be in Paris alongside Dr. Tedros and other UN officials attending this uh, conference that Christian has referred to. It's the Humanitarian Conference for Sudan and its neighbors. France, Germany, and the European Union will be co-hosting this press conference where Mrs. Msuya will advocate for scaled up resources to expand our operations in Sudan and in the region as a whole. She will also advocate for improved humanitarian access so that agencies can ensure the timely delivery of life-saving supplies, which we have heard is particularly difficult to the communities in need. And we will have also a message from the Secretary General for the conference. And I'll conclude this part on a uh, briefing on Sudan by saying that the UN fact-finding mission on Sudan has released some heartbreaking figures, much uh, in, on the line of what our colleagues have said, and I would invite you to consult their website for the details. So let's open now the floor to question for um, uh, to question for our briefers on Sudan. Is there any in the room? And I don't see any, so let's go to the platform. Um, I've got uh, uh, Lisa, Lisa Schlein, Voice of America. Can you please, Lisa, tell to whom you address your question? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> hi to anyone who has a good answer. Um, I I know that you, Christian, we have we have tamed you, so you will send us your notes. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thank you. But uh, could I ask the I IFRC and UNDP representatives to do the same, and as soon as possible, not at the end of the day when deadlines have been missed. Thank you. As far as the question goes, I heard that. An interview with somebody from NSF, from um, Doctors Without Borders, that said that actually famine uh, is is happening uh, in uh, Sudan. Uh, the uh, he mentioned the city. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of that. But what do you know about that? Um, is it yes? And 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 he said one of three children, very young children, were dying, which is kind of 
beyond words. So what do you know about that? Um, uh, how, how close are we to this happening? And then uh, you, you representatives speak about negotiations and the importance of ceasefires, but is this a possibility or are the, um, the generals really uh, so entrenched in uh, what they're doing and their power grab that this seems to be uh, a distant hope? Um, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very much, Lisa. I don't know who would like to take. First of all, they they, they note uh, UNDP. Sarah tells me that she has already sent them out. So I hope Christian and, and uh, Tommaso will do the same for the other two speakers. Um, yeah, I see, uh, Mr. Abdul Kadir. Uh, I saw your hand up. Would you like to start answering? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, probably I was uh, taking my note, but nevertheless. I think the, the, the truth and the truth and nothing but the truth is that the humanitarian challenges in Sudan are a lot. I mean, even without the war, we already had a, a food deficit in the country. To date, we are talking about 18 million or 17.7 7 million, or 18 million, as Christian has said, or people in need of food uh, assistance. And with the war, uh, without any doubt, uh, it has and will affect the food production in the country. So we are actually looking at a critical situation because... One, uh, livelihood have been disrupted, food production has been disrupted, entirely dependent on external aid uh, to feed the population. Uh, and you've heard about the funding levels, uh, both in the UN, the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement has been very minimum. Uh, that's why the call for ceasefire, the call for uh, people to sit down and look at the humanitarian consequences of their action and to try and ensure the Sudanese people suffering are put to an end. The Sudanese people have suffered enough. Uh, the challenges ahead are even bigger because people have to recover from the current crisis. But the situation is that, uh, yes, war causes challenges, war causes disruption, and um, the, the climate change has not stopped doing what it does. Thank you very much, sir. Maybe, uh, Tahir, you would like to add something? Thank you. Uh, no, I just wanted to add that the uh, possibility for a famine it is absolutely there, considering uh, that there is a, a severe uh, uh, reduction in the production of food in Sudan. Plus, as as uh, the the numbers I was mentioning in in uh, in our uh, uh, analysis or assessment, socioeconomic assessment, that the uh, uh, income also was uh, uh, affected uh, negatively for most of the households in Sudan. So definitely, I mean, we, if we do not do something now, we will be heading towards that uh, direction. And, and this is where I hope the politicians and the uh, parties of the war will, will realize the uh, impact of this war uh, on the normal uh, Sudanese lives. Thank you very much, sir. Let me go to another question from Yuri Aprelev, Ria Novosti. Yuri, good morning. Yes, uh, good morning, Alessandra. Uh, I think my question is not only for one speaker, but I think for everybody. There is a, a, a lack of uh, money, of course, in this conflict. There is a lack of interest from the media and from the governments uh, in general. What do you think can be done to be changed in that? Because every time when we are speaking about Sudan, we all hear the same things that nothing is funded. Uh, nobody is trying at least to cover this. Um, I, I'm not speaking about the media. I mean about the government at the same time. This is not a crisis where we are hearing big leaders talking about. So what do you think that can be changed? And uh, what will be the consequences if nothing change? If, for example, the money that you are asking is not coming and you will stay at 7% or 11% of what you are, you are asking. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yuri. I think uh, you are absolutely right. So that's a challenge for all of us, for us and for you, of course, also to keep the interest alive in uh, crises that are not necessarily uh, under the 
the limelight. But uh, uh, I, of course, ask my colleagues to answer. But I think this uh, humanitarian conference for Sudan one year after the start of the uh, conflict is exactly the kind of uh, initiative of the international community that we are expecting in order to uh, bring the attention to this crisis that, uh, while being forgotten or, or uh, sidelined, are extremely important. As we heard, the numbers are, are just heartbreaking. So I don't know, I will ask maybe uh, Tahir or Christian or Farid to, to answer. Just I see Tahir's hand. Go ahead, Tahir. Thanks. Uh, uh, in, in fact, I just wanted to re-emphasize that, yes, if there is no action now, it will be, I mean, the, the consequences will, will be really catastrophic. Uh, 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 more than 25 million uh, in uh, Sudan now, they are being recognized that they, they, they need uh, uh, assistance by, by the UN standards. And if, and it is the biggest uh, uh, um, a crisis in the whole world, but it is not getting enough media attention, considering that there might be also other uh, 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 international crises in the world uh, that might be more interesting for political reasons. But indeed, Sudan is the biggest humanitarian crisis uh, uh, in the current uh, time. Uh, I think if we do not do something now, the the uh, uh, crisis within the country will be uh, enlarged. Uh, more people will be in need. And I think the impact of this crisis will cross the borders very soon uh, if we do not really step up for for uh, a crisis in this size. Uh, I, I uh, imagine the, the uh, Sudanese uh, will have further complications inside, but also there, there might be also a greater impact uh, uh, fleeing outside of the country if we do not do something uh, that can save the situation. Thank you very much, Tahir. I don't know if I were to other speak. Yeah, Farid, uh, I see your Thank hand. Thank you very much. Uh, I think as uh, Christian said, the WHO is doing its part, as Tai said, they're doing their part on our side. And as we said, we're doing our part. Mm -hmm. If there is less media attention to the world's biggest uh, uh, humanitarian crisis in terms of displacement of population, if the humanitarian world has done their part, the media also has their part. So I would ask the uh, esteemed journalists to ask the question, what have you done to ensure you highlight the challenges that are being faced today in Sudan and other parts of the country? How many people should, should die? How many? How much suffering? Should, should happen until then you revive and you highlight and profile. You're the ones with the cameras, not us. Um, two, I think it's also time to deeply reflect on the current humanitarian challenges in the world today. The images being seen, uh, the rhetoric from all sides that you see. Uh, it's time for the world to deeply reflect on what is happening in the world today. Uh, and the humanitarian challenges is facing. But worst of all, what is the consequences of such challenges in the future? And uh, the, 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 to the human being who sees a child suffering or the mother looking for a hospital to give birth uh, or a child who needs food to be able to ensure that they survive the day, uh, it's time to deeply reflect and look at the conscience of a man and what is in this uh, world today that is looking at suffering and, and, and all this pain and they don't feel the urge to support or they don't feel the urge to extend a helping hand? Is it that the minds that have changed or is it that the hearts have changed? And it's time to reflect and ensure that humanity uh, put humanitarian uh, needs and, and, and the suffering of the people and it should be a feeling from deep inside. And if it's not, then we should ask our question is, where are we going from here? Thank you very much. Um, let me see um, if there's any other question. I don't see any. So thank you very much to our speakers. Christian, you stay with us because we haven't finished with you. Uh, Catherine, is that also on Sudan? Because I would like to go to the next topic. Yes, good morning, Alessandra. No, it's not on Sudan. It's regarding the conference taking place on Monday. 
could you be yeah. kind enough to send, um, I mean, to share with us uh, what um, the SG is going to say uh, as soon as you get it? Yeah, sure. I, 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 I'd be happy to, but it is about Sudan because the conference is on Sudan. Yeah, so, yeah, but yes, I mean, I'm talking Sudan about the SG. And we'll with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am pretty sure that he ends afterwards, so we'll be able to also um, uh, assist you on uh, on uh, this press conference, on this conference. But definitely, we will, uh, if we have it under embargo, we will send it to you, of course. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, so I would like to thank Tahir and Farid for this briefing. As I said, Christian stays with us uh, because now let's go to our next uh, item on the agenda, which is Gaza. And WHO has brought us um, two of their colleagues from Gaza. And of course, uh, uh, Richard Peppercorn doesn't need introductions. You all know him as the WHO representative in the occupied Palestinian territory. But we also have with us Thanos Gargava Gargavanis, who is the WHO trauma surgeon and emergency officer in Gaza. Guess, uh, you are extremely busy, uh, Mr. Gargavanis, and we are very happy that you took uh, some time to brief the journalist in Geneva. So, Christian, should I give directly the, the floor to, um, to Richard? I see you nodding. So, Richard, welcome. Thank you very much for being us, uh, for, with us today. Um, you have the floor for a brief introduction, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you, good morning, and I hope you can hear me clearly. Greetings from Gaza. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Um, yeah, I would like to um, uh, to I would like to focus actually on two two issues on on a mission of the tenth of April, the day before yesterday, from WHO together with Ocha and Anwar to Khan Yunus, uh, and then my colleague uh, Dr. Thomas Gargavis will maybe focus a little bit on his missions to Shifa and, and more specifically. The Shifa hospitals. So on the 10th of April, we visited Khan Yunus. And first of all, I want to stress the, the destruction in Khan Yunus is, is beyond belief. I mean, like we had seen it early February when we entered from the west. Now we entered from the east and we crisscrossed through all of Khan Yunus. It's disproportionate to anything one can imagine. It's no building or roads is actually intact. There, there's only rubble and dirt. So we saw quite a bit of, this was the E-Day, the first E-Day, we saw quite a few uh, people actually moving, sometimes very eerie, moving into Khan Yunus, sometimes in their Eid outfits, uh, looking for their houses, which of course they couldn't find because most of them were damaged or destroyed, uh, trying to see if they could get anything out of their houses, uh, and we saw other people trying to uh, to scavenge for 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 wood, etc., and, and and other issues. I want to focus now on on health. Uh, so on this trip, uh, we we visited four hospitals in Khan Yunus, uh, and actually we also passed the WHO warehouse. The WHO had two warehouses in Khan Yunus. They are fortunately both destroyed due to the hostilities in its vicinity. So let me start with the most important hospital in Khan Yunus and actually the second most important hospital in, in Gaza, the Nasser Medical Complex. Uh, and it serves most of the medical specializations. Uh, it had a, was a 350 bed hospital. And then you might recall in, in the, the early months of this conflict actually provided service to more than 700 people actually in Nasser uh, Medical Complex. WHO also for years we, uh, support this uh, this complex, including the limb and reconstruction center. So the Nasser Medical Complex they be became non-functional after the last siege in February, and I think we reported extensively on that that WHO organizers supported with the Palestinian Red Crescent and OCHA uh, the medevac of the last uh, number of patients and staff around a couple of days around the 20th of February. So it was then already reported that uh, that um, the warehouse, uh, the warehouse of Nasser Medical Complex was severely damaged and, and partly burned out. We have now witnessed um, that the hospital warehouse, which used to supply many hospitals in the south, in the south, was burning and actually it's completely destroyed. And 
an incredibly sad sight to see because also realize that WHO and partners, we provide a substantial amount of medical supplies, trauma supplies, equipment, essential medicines, uh, which are all gone. Solar panels are missing, the south wall was torn down, etc. We went all through the hospitals and it's damaged, damaged. The hospital is still standing, at least the main buildings, but damage is, is incredible. It's an incredible mess. Critical assets, such as the CT scanner, the ICU equipment, etc. They seem functional, but we have to inspect by a med by, by medical uh, by a medical engineer. X-ray uh, destroyed mobile, X-ray uh, destro destroyed extensive destruction of surgical material, anesthesia devices destroyed, large hole dug up in the in, in the building, etc. The limb reconstruction center, heavily supported by the WHO, unrecognized, uh, unrecognizable maternity ward and equipment uh, destroyed, and so and so forth. Um, then Alamal, PSCS hospital. A immense structural uh, destruction, even more, I would say, in the Nasa Medical Complex. And, and uh, compared to the February 25th, when WHO mission was lost there, uh, ambulances cannot enter or exit, a huge hole, uh, damages in the radiology department, third floor totally ru ruined, mobile x ray uh, ruined, etc. Th three out of five operational tiers are still functional. The other two have been destroyed. The main hospital generators completely destroyed, etc. It was actually encouraging and, and also surprising to meet the director, Dr. Heider, and some of the health workers which were present and still took the in initiative to treat some trauma and maternity emergency. And they plan to expand the inpatient capacity and to repair, restart some basic services, uh, hopefully the coming uh, week. And... Alger Hospital was the third hospital visit. Was as a private NGO hospital linked to Al Sahaba Hospital in the north, focused on maternal and child health, a little bit like Al Amal. Uh, just want to say, supported by other partners, including UNFPA, five floors still standing, but everywhere heavily damaged, smashed, etc., non-functional. The Jordanian um, hospital is actually the only small hospital which is. Functional, I would call it minimal or fu uh, functional. Now, I want to say something because we get a lot of questions about that and it's uh, becoming a bit of a topic, and that is good. We get questions about rehabilitation of hospitals and facility. And, and, and just to be very clear, WHO and partners, we are ready to support efforts to revive priority functions of key hospitals and pragmatically rehabilitate. And let's, let's not forget that just recently, Al Shipa, when it was non-functional after the first siege, it became partially functional again. Thanks, first and foremost, thanks to their health workers. Then with support of WHO and partners, it became again like a functional first referral hospital, uh, the trauma center for the north, etc. some dialysis patients, etc. Unfortunately, now not functional anymore. Thomas will refer to that. So we know there's enormous need for hospital capacity. So we plan and would, we would like to support rehabilitation of these key hospitals like Al Shifa, like Nasser Medical Complex. Can we assist uh, the Al Amal, the PRCS Hospital, Ger, and a number? But for that, first of all, what is needed is a sustained deconfliction to work and to get WHO supported medical electrical and water engineers in to do a proper assessment and planning. We need to get, of course, focused on the planning on building mater material, but also think about heavy generators, solar infrastructure, specific medical images, equipment, CTs, MRIs, X-rays, lab equipment, as equipment for oxygen plants. Uh, and, 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 and besides the what we call the regular stuff, medical supplies, trauma, essential medicines. And it is important to note that before this crisis, it was extremely hard to get any specialized medical equipment into Gaza, X-rays, MRI, CT scans, or their spare parts. I mean, and I don't even want to discuss large generators. WHO, we, we, it took us two years to get three mobile X-rays into Gaza, mobile X-rays which, which you have in every referral hospital. So this kind of import restrictions will have to change if you want to focus on any substantial rehabilitation. But more important, we have seen how fragile 
these gains are and how quickly efforts to restore hospitals, look at Shifa, can be lost due to hostilities and attacks. Look at Nasser Medical Complex. So this is also not sustainable and a huge strain on health partners and, and of course, our scarce resources. So a lasting ceasefire is, of course, needed to, to really go forward with meaningful restoration and rehabilitation of the health system. But we, WHO and partners, are very much ready for this. We're planning for that. And we're looking forward to come, to, to, to take uh, that road forward. I want to shift now to, to Thanos, uh, to Dr. Thanos, and maybe some additional comments. He's our uh, trauma lead. He's also the WHO surgeon. So I want to maybe his insights a little bit on our recent visit and specifically on our chief. Thanos, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, and I give the floor to Thanos. Please remember, we only have 50 minutes, so if you could be brief, please, because I know there are questions, and we will not be able to take them if we don't short Thank it up very... a little bit. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, we are here in Gaza, and while uh, my head of office, Dr. Peppercorn, already uh, explained you the situation in Kanyunis, I would like to focus on Shifa. Shifa Hospital used to be the biggest hospital uh, along the Gaza Strip. It used to be the center of all specialties uh, besides oncology, even though if some uh, level of oncology treatment was taken there. And unfortunately, what we saw when we went last week to Shifa is that the hospital has been turned into dust and rubble. It has been completely destroyed Valuable assets like the oxygen plant, like the CT scan, like uh, laboratory equipment, and like critical pieces of equipment uh, that, that are necessary for all operations, like ventilators, like anesthesia devices, like machines that require are required for any doctor to, to, to provide life-saving interventions, are all destroyed. The maternity ward has some uh, incubators that seem intact, but this is just one, the, the only nice, the only nice part of this assessment. The buildings themselves are burnt down, walls are missing, there are holes of uh, shrapnel and fire all along them, and the specially, a specialized surgery building that used to shelter all surgical specialties is now having a huge crater from the basement to the second floor. On the way forward, we are sure that these buildings have to be evaluated by specialists and by, a, by, by an engineer so that we can know whether their, uh, their, their structural integrity is still viable or not. Because to my eyes, as a surgeon and as somebody who does not know of engineering, I do not think that it would be possible that these two buildings will be rehabilitated. Moreover, it is it was shocking to be realizing that the hospital's open spaces were filled with uh, makeshift graves for people that lost their lives there. Some of them they had some names on, some of them they had not their names on. And it was really shocking as well to be seeing that we had bodies that had been left uncovered or covered with some plastic sheet on the sides of the buildings. WHO, along with uh, other UN agencies, organized a process for the dignified burial of these of these people. We made sure that each remains were put in separate body bags so that they could properly receive burial rituals and secondly, be identified using DNA and forensic practices in the future by their families so that their families can find some consolation. We still stress that right now, Gaza Strip's bigger hospital was the only one that could provide with the support of uh, medical oxygen in the north of Wadi Gaza Strip. This means that right now, medical oxygen can be produced only in one small hospital, Kamal Adwan Hospital, which is a pediatric hospital, and obviously the quantities are suboptimal. From a medical perspective, after this destruction, we feel that we are returning 60 years before when medical imaging was not available, where uh, elaborate laboratory tests were not available, and doctors and nurses had to be used only the clinical treatment and make patients better. 
we want to stress again that hospitals should never uh -huh. be militarized. And I would like to thank you for your time, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, the line at the, at the end was not perfect, but we understood uh, everything. So I'll open now the floor to question, knowing that, as we said at the beginning, we will also have at 11.30 the uh, briefing by Mr. McGoldrick, uh, very much on the same subject as he was, he was in, in Gaza very recently. Um, let me see if there are questions in the room. I'll give the floor to Nina Larson, who is the um, uh, correspondent of the AFP, the French News Agency. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thanks for taking my question. I was wondering if um, you had details on how many uh, bodies were buried and, and found within Shifa, and then also uh, on the issue of uh, tr wanting to rehabilitate um, the other hospitals, how much access does WHO have uh, there? And uh, what do you think the possibility of doing so is, especially um, uh, and in bringing in uh, this advanced, uh, these, uh, this advanced equipment that, uh, that uh, Dr. Peepercorn was, was talking about? Thank you. Thanos? You need to unmute yourself on your side. We unmute you here, but you need to do it on your side. Go ahead. My, my apologies. Thank you very, very much. No worries. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for your question. I can talk only of what we saw when we were there. So while our presence in Shifa uh, was only some hours for security reasons, we found eight bodies, remains of eight bodies there. However, more, they're buried in a makeshift cemetery in one of the open spaces, and more were remaining under rubble, and some of them seen, visibly seen, under plastic sheets. So, unfortunately, I cannot give you precise numbers, but I can surely say that while we were there, we found remains of eight bodies. Regarding the other question for rehabilitation and access for uh, elaborate equipment and supplies, as uh, Dr. Peppercorn uh, explained late be before, before the war, it was extremely difficult to bring inside Gaza these pieces of elaborate equipment. Uh, Rick, would you like to uh, give some more information on this, please? Well, yeah, I can, I can add. So just as an example, uh, uh, for example, I, I think I raised this already, that that over the last two years, I recall that um, we wanted to assist with, uh, I think it was 10 uh, mobile x-rays for Gaza. And, and it took us almost two years to get three in, I mean, in location and in place. And that shows a little bit uh, the paperwork, the red tape, the bureaucracy uh, around all of that to get this kind of specialized uh, equipment um, in but uh, but i want to be uh, clear on this i think not that i'm positive at the moment and in a positive mood but i think we have to and if you look at uh, we have to look forwards and and then you talk of course about pragmatic uh pragmatic rehabilitation of hospitals so first in this current uh in this current phase well there's still a war going on so how can they become, again, partially or minimum functional? And then you look, of course, on how can they become a trauma stabilization point? How can they uh, deliver some outpatient uh, uh, department activities, primary health care, et cetera? You focus on the, on the basics. Can any of the emergency medical teams assist in this process? So we are also coordinating emergency medical teams that one or two have reached out to us and said, well, we are willing, we, if if feasible, and of course it all depends on the security and, and, and if feasible to assist there as well. So we're looking at this kind of uh, um, combinations. And then, uh, so I was, uh, in that sense, uh, I think it was a, a, a little bit of, an, of an spirit, a positive spirit when we were, for example, in Alamal Hospital, the PRCS hospital, so first to meet the director and the staff and to, to hear that, okay, they were still trying to treat some trauma patients when they came in and even some maternity. And they were they were trying to push to open up some of their work again over the coming week. Well, we, of course, have to assist 
them as good as possible. The same applies for Nostra Medical Complex. But if you look Thank at proper rehabilitation, then I think I described that in my introduction. You we really need much, much more. Yes, thank you very much. So I'll go to John Zarukostas, The Lancet and France 24. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, my question is to Dr. Thanos Gargavanis, Kalimerasas. I was wondering, sir, if uh, you could elaborate on the lo loss of medical oxygen, what is being done to bring in supplies, since that is critical for many of your interventions. And secondly, the loss of such a big referral hospital, what does it mean now for all the patients? Where are you going to redirect them? Thank you, John. Thank you very much, John. Uh, first of all, the loss of medical oxygen for North Ode and Wadi Gaza is a really critical issue. Before this war, Shifa was able to use uh, electricity to, prov to deliver oxygen to the North. However, after this attack, the needs are escalating. We are working uh, with all parties to make sure that we make available oxygen inside. However, in the recent past, we have been denied multiple times oxygen tanks uh, as possible dual use, dual, use ax, uh, dual use items by the Israeli authorities. Eventually, this has been overcome. Right now, we're in a phase where we can import these kind of supplies. However, this shows that the needs are way bigger than what we can actually cover with the existing mechanism for the import of goods and supplies. We have to scale up. Regarding patients in the North, we would like to stress again that right now, there are very few places all along the Gaza Strip, and mostly in the South, that can provide the full set of surgical operations required. And a structured medical evacuation mechanism has to be established. We are not there yet. Medical evacuations until now are ad hoc, haphazard, and have to do with bilateral agreements between uh, the Palestinian authorities, and third countries. When a third country says that we can receive X number of patients, then a medical evacuation is way easier. However, we are still in a phase where there's no mechanism in place. There's no standardized approach. And this puts us all in a really difficult situation. We need to go forward to have a standardized medical evacuation mechanism that will be allowing on a daily basis to, to evacuate at least 50 patients. Right now, the moment we're talking, uh, we have a list of more than 9,000 patients that require to be moved abroad for the continuation of their treatment. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. We have the time for the last question. Nick, I'm in Bruce, the New York, New York Times. Yeah, thank you very much. I just wanted to ask you uh, briefly, what has improved in terms of resupplying medical requirement in the in the last week for sort of 10 days and um, you've talked about the need for a standardized system for medical evacuations thanks for that it was my question but what's actually holding back you what's holding you back from getting that standardized system um, this is something that's been discussed for a while what, what's holding it back thanks right now the current situation is extremely challenging because too many parties are involved and unfortunately, we don't have a blanket coverage of import of supplies and equipment for WHO. What we are asking for is that medical equipment and supplies and consumables should be not considered as possible dual use items because right now the delays are all related to security concerns. Moreover, I would like to, I would like to add that right now we still have the issue of coordinating with neighboring countries. So until now, again, we have to stress out that medical supplies are not considered as top priority items. And the improvement has to do with bilateral agreements between agencies like WHO and the Israeli and Egyptian authorities to make sure that these items become available on the ground. Rick. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. First of all, it's an... Uh... Uh, Thanos already discussed the whole the, the mechanism. 9,000 plus patients need to be urgently evacuated. So you need a system of that. So there's a an, 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 an security screening, both by the Israeli side and by the Egyptian side. 
uh, we were asked at WHO already back in November to come up with an, um, an, a proposal, which we did. And we were thinking on batches of 60 to 70 patients uh, per day. And, and, and the authorities would like WHO to vet those patients. So it came from the ministry, the hospital directors, etc. Criteria will be added, criteria will be added on age restrictions, etc., which became unworkable, unworkable. And, and what we've seen up till now is a dysfunctional Medivac system. It's a lack of transparency. There's only two and a half thousand patients have been coming out of that. While we expect, uh, we estimate six to six and a half thousand trauma related patients and two to three thousand plus medical cases. Not forgetting that before this crisis, between 50 and 100 patients daily were referred to East Jerusalem and to the West Bank. And 50% of that was oncology cancer related. So that's uh, with so. We are ready, and we understand that from the Egyptian side, um, the Egyptian government is ready to receive these patients. Some of the countries in the region have reached out and already have accepted patients, Qatar, UAE, etc. More pay, uh, countries have reached out. Some of the European countries have expressed interest to take patients. We hope that the EU will come together and also be clear that are they able to receive a number of thousands of patients and their companions, etc.? Also, that we get clear ideas about that, and we are ready to facilitate and to uh, to support that. So that's a. Uh, and the other thing I think is Thomas made a really good point. What I'm really mm -hmm. surprised about, if WHO is 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 coming up with a list of supplies, etc., like everywhere around the world, we get access to those supplies. Here we struggle in some areas, and the last part I want to make: the confliction mechanism is still not complete, is still not working. Today's WHO mission to Al Ahly to deliver fuel and transfer three patients for the night, and yesterday our mission to Kamal Adwan, where we would both go to transfer three critical kids patients to the south, was also denied. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Thanks to uh, you and Thanos for this very important update. As uh, of course, we have come up uh, to 11, almost 11:30. 11 uh, uh, we'll stay with Gaza with Jamie McGoldrick, who's already online. Uh, but I just ask Jens to very, very briefly. You have one minute for your announcement, and then we will close the briefing and we'll go to Jamie. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh I'll be very quick, uh, and I've sent you a, a media advisory. It's for next Tuesday. Uh, we have a high-level pledging event for the humanitarian situation in Ethiopia. It starts at uh, 3 p.m. Um, here in the Palais de Nation in room 23, and you're welcome to, to join us there to, to listen in. It's also webcast on UN Web TV. It will wrap up at 6 p.m., and we will send you the pledging result. Uh, at that point, we are working on um, a media availability at noon uh, with high level representatives of the three uh, cohorts, which is the uh, government of Ethiopia, the government of the United Kingdom and us from Ocha. So that will be noon on Tuesday and then the event itself at 3 p.m. Thanks. And um, I see that Christian has put in the notes that the, the WHO will also have an Ethiopia statement coming today as well to you. So thank you very much. Um, uh, Human Rights uh, Council asks me to inform you that the Permanent Forum of People of African Descent will hold its third session in Geneva from 16 to 19 April 2024. I don't have time to go into the details, but Pascal will send you the uh, information. So thank you very much. This uh, uh, closes the briefing today. And I would like now to cede my seat to uh, Jens to moderate the press conference with Jamie McGoldrick. Jamie, thank you so much. We know you are in a very tight schedule. It's your last day. Um, uh, and you are coming to us to brief us on these three months and what you have seen in your recent mission to Gaza. Thanks for being with us and the Geneva journalist. Jens, please. Give us one minute to change seats. And, and I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you. There you go. Not Thank you very much, um, Alessandra, and welcome to uh, this uh, press briefing with uh, 
Jimmy McGoldrick, who's with us online now uh, from uh, OPT. Uh, Jamie wraps up his three month mission uh, as humanitarian coordinator as, in, as interim uh, there, and he's also just been to Gaza, I know. So I will give him, him the floor for his introductory remarks, and then we'll take your questions in the room uh, and online. Martin, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jens. I hope you can hear me okay. Okay. We can. Right, thanks a lot. I mean, I was in Gaza a few days ago, just my last time, and it was quite a sad thing for me to leave after only being here for a short period of time and obviously not getting all that I wanted done, done. But um, I think that some of the things are still going on I'd like to mention. The fact that what, what we see in Gaza right now and in Rafa in particular was two things that I think is predominant. One was the fact that people themselves, the citizens there, the civilians, are very worried about the potential of a Rafa incursion. I think that's the first thing. Uh, and because of that, you see some of the previously congested areas of uh, Rafa being, you know, more crowds moving away, going to Al Mawasa and other places on the coast, fearing the possibility of an incursion. I think the other thing I would note is the fact that, um, you know, the fact that what recently happened in terms of that tragic event where seven humanitarian workers for what Central Kitchen died, and given the fact that they were quite well placed vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli government and, and a much more a privileged position than maybe some of the other organizations, I think the the humanitarian workers there then fear for their own safety. And um, as as we know, the deconfliction and notification system has got flaws. And I think these flaws um, appeared quite starkly in that incident regarding the the World Central Kitchen and something we are trying to, we've been constantly trying to remind the Israelis that this is not a one-off incident. Uh, we've had many incidents of that kind. And tragically, as you saw yesterday, there was another uh, bullet shot at a UNICEF car. And so clearly the system that we have in terms of how deconfliction works, how we work with the, interact with the Israeli Defence Force and the way we notify and communicate is challenged. We don't have communications equipment inside uh, Gaza to operate properly as you wouldn't have in any other situation. And secondly, um, you know, we don't have a hotline or an emergency number to call in the case of an emergency incident that arrives. And so it's important that we get that addressed. I, I met a few days ago with uh, the head of Southern Command of IDF and laid out some of the, the issues that we face regarding our interaction with the, with the IDF and operating generally inside the Gaza context. Maybe just sort of some of the details on the ground. As you know, Israel pulled out of Han Yunus a few days ago, um, but they've also moved into some of the central area camps around Nusarat. And an UNRWA school was hit twice, actually, a shelter. Um, we had not missions planned for the north today. They've all been cancelled, including a recce that was actually going to go to Erez as part of this announcement by Israel that we were going to open up more corridors and more possibilities of bringing food in and other goods in from Ashdod through Erez. Um, however, the, the Jerusalem side, the, the actual, on the Israeli side, there was a mission that went in today to look at the Erez and the place called West Erez, or Zikim, which is on the coastline down south from Ashdod port. Um, there was the interagency mission took place also into Han Yunus recently, uh, following the withdrawal of uh, Israeli troops, and, and then they, they examined the status of the infrastructure, health facilities, water points, and storage facilities. Uh, WHO reported extensive destruction of the infrastructure, and they actually talked about, you know, some um, intentional destruction of medical equipment as well. There's a high presence of unexploded ordnance on the route and even inside the area itself, and there was reports of a uh, hundred kg bombs being lit on the roadside. This is going to be a real challenge for two things: one, for obviously people returning to where these places, which people will leave from Rafa desperately to get away from any incursion. And secondly, it will make our challenges of supplying material into those areas uh, difficult because of the, the, the threat to that. So we would have to start looking at that in a different way. Anyway, I would also say that um, the, the conditions on the ground haven't improved any uh, in any meaningful way. You know, the, the, I think there's going to be the, the immediate thing, which is obviously what we face just now, the, 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 the challenge of water. This is becoming uh, very hot there now. The water supply system, people have got very much less water than they need. And as a result of that, waterborne diseases due to the lack of safe and clean water and the destruction of the sanitation systems. 
you know, they're all bringing about um, problems for uh, the, the population living there. As a result of that, there's been a lot of uh, illnesses that have uh, arisen, which are waterborne disease illnesses. And um, so we have to find a way in the months ahead of how we can have a better supply of water into the areas where people are currently crowded at the moment. And uh, as we know, the, the hospital system there, Shifa and Nasa, the two big hospitals, have been badly damaged or, in fact, destroyed. And what we have now is three quarters of the hospitals and most of the primary health care clinics are shutting down, leaving only 10 of 36 hospitals functioning. We hear of amputations being um, carried out without anaesthesia. You know, miscarriages have increased by a massive number. And I think all of those um, systems which are not in place, are the, the soaring rates of infectious diseases, you know, um, hepatitis A, dehydration, respiratory infections and diarrhea. And obviously, given the fact that our supply chain is so weak, we haven't been able to um, deliver enough assistance into the north part of Gaza. We've had in the last, since, it, since it, the, the road opened on the military side, we've had eight convoys. And that's not every day. Um, the other roads, the Saladin Road in the south, the middle road is not working because it's inoperable because it's destroyed. And the coast road hasn't been open for almost a month. So we have a very limited supply into the north. I was up there a couple of weeks ago, I went to Kamal Adwan Hospital and saw myself inside the, the actual hospital, the children's ward. Every single patient there was facing really serious food insecurity issues, dehydration, emaciation. And we heard from Dr. Usman, who was there, that a child had died the day before, one who was in that ward. So a very precarious situation. WHO and UNICEF are trying their best to get more material in there in order to try and satisfy that need. And also the fact that you know, we have to get nutritional, not just general food, but specialised nutritional products for children. I then visited the, the neonatal ward and uh, there's lack of incubators. Children doubled up in the incubators. And then uh, the last child I saw was in an incubator who was two. And, uh, there's lack of incubators. Children doubled up in the incubators. And then uh, the last child I saw was in an incubator who was two, two days old, a boy, but who wasn't prematurely born, born in nine months, but he was 1.2 kilos. So low, low weight birth is going to be a real problem, I think, for um, for children of that kind, people who are not getting nutritional. There's going to be long-term consequences which will be felt and the development possibilities of that child or those children are going to be quite limited, I would say. Um, we've heard from Israel a lot of announcements of them over the last days of the fact that they want to um, open up and be much more um, supportive of that. One of the claims they also say is that there's the, the, they've put in 1,000 trucks over the last few days, entered into Gaza, and only around 800 have been collected by the Palestinian side. There are challenges in that regard because um, the, the number scanned by Israel doesn't correlate with the number of trucks being collected and dispatched inside Gaza. There's many reasons for that. We have to... We have to load and offload uh, the trucks that come from uh, Israel. Israel believes that their responsibility ends when they deliver trucks from Kerem Shalom into the Palestinian side. And, and I would say that that's certainly not the case. Their responsibility ends and when we re aid reaches the civilians in Gaza. And we have to have them supportive of that. And that means allowing more facilitation, allows more, more routes in. And, uh, and obviously to provide security for us as we move. At the moment, we don't have security. The blue policemen who were there before are no longer able to do the job of securing convoys of um, crowd control, etc. We don't have that anymore. And so what we have instead is um, the possibilities of getting ransacked and looted, which is a common occurrence in a place where people are very desperate. And it's a common occurrence where places are very congested. The roads are in bad shape. And we use very predictable roads to move goods around. So we face real law and order problems. And there's a security vacuum there that's been filled by various groups. Some of them, we don't know who they are, but they are there because of organizing traffic control. You see some guns, AK-47s and pistols around. So there's clearly groups that are there. And there have been incidents uh, recently when we're coming out of the Rafa Blue Gate, when you have um, smugglers who are there waiting to get the cigarettes that have been brought in from Egypt, there's always a squabbling over who gets them because it's a very high value um, commodity. And uh, most recently, there was a couple of gunfights outside the gate where we normally go and uh, a couple of people were shot and killed. And so that's the environment we're working in. And it's, it's very easy for Israel to say, we've sent you a thousand trucks, so please deliver them inside Gaza. Uh, I say it goes on much more than that. Well, last, for example, we are trying to move goods around and move goods to the north 
Um, there's only the three roads there we've mentioned, the, the, the middle road, which is Saladin Road, the coastal road, which is Al Rashid Road, and then there's a military road on the east side. At no point in time in the last month and more have we had three or even two of those roads working at the same time simultaneously. And the roads themselves are in very poor condition. And also when we do use the one road, which is the Saladin Road, where yesterday where UNICEF was, was uh, shot, uh, what happened there was that um, we were held, that there's a holding area at the checkpoint and we are held there for hours. And so far this month, we've wasted 60 hours of trucks going up there downtown on, on dead time on convoys. And this means that, that those trucks, those people are locked into that place for a long time. And then what happens sometimes it's too late in the day because it's we can only, only travel in daylight hours to go north and therefore the, sometimes the mission is cancelled. And then we get blamed by Israel for... Uh, cancelling the, the convoy, cancelling the, the, the mission to the north. And uh, we need to get a better um, a better understanding from them of what that looks like. Um, I had a meeting this week with Major General Finkelman. Um, he's the head of the Southern Command of the IDF. And uh, we talked very openly about some of the things that are missing. This came as a result of the World Central Kitchen issue and the complaints we made about the deconfliction and notification system being wrong, not being working, not predictable, not protecting humanitarian workers. We talked about the communications challenges. We are working in a very hostile area as humanitarians without the possibility of contacting each other. We don't have radios. We don't have mobile networks that work. And so what we then do is we have to find ways of passing messages back to Watcher and other organizations in Rafa and then relaying it out. And if we have a serious security incident, we don't have a hotline. We don't have any way of communicating the IDF if we're facing tr problems at a checkpoint or facing problems en route. And I think there's another thing I would say that there's a real challenge of weapons discipline and a challenge of the behavior of soldiers at checkpoints. And we've tried time and time again to bring to their attention. Whereas I think one of the things that we, that we, should, we should understand that the IDF have never worked with humanitarian organizations before in this type of environment. They don't understand how we function. They don't understand our language, what our purpose is. And we don't understand their expectations. And there's a degree of mistrust and misunderstanding that we have to address. And this meeting with Major General Finkelman of the, the IDF, I think hopefully helps that because he said, you, you told us that we, he sees us as we're not against them. You're working and serving for a good goal and it's a challenging environment. So, you know, we want to work with them differently. We want to um, find ways how we can get to speak to soldiers in a way at the checkpoint that, that's more respectful and more trustful. And that's something he said he would take forward and help move that. He talked about markings on vehicles that have to be much more clearer in terms of showing the, the UN or the NGOs working there. And we need to have much more regular engagement with the IDF. Right now, that's the first time I've met them since I've been here. And we have to find ways of having a joint operation cell, which we can then discuss some of these challenges. And then also to have this hotline or this number that we can call in the event of a crisis. But more importantly for ourselves, we need communications equipment. We need to get mobile phones. We get 3G. We have to get VHF repeaters. We have to get sat phones. All of the things we need, as we have in any other operation, this is the, the, an operation I've never seen the lack of um, communications equipment in a very hostile environment. Um, and then we've also had discussions this week on the, the US peer, um, this new temporary peer, the floating peer that's talked about. Um, we've been discussing about how that's set up, how it looks like, and then ultimately how we would operate or interact with it. There's still work to be done on that in terms of what it is. We had a we, we'd hoped that the the pier would be in the north of Gaza to address the the the, the imminent famine famine challenges in the north, and we would hope that's where we could actually do the, do the work. Um, however, it's been decided that it would come south, and it would be where the where the, the IDF have a base or have a a compound and have a military road, and that's where we will that will now be there. We have still some concerns over the perception and the neutrality of the project. And because uh, in many ways, the, the plan or the operation that's been set up actually embeds us in a, a, an IDF surrounded perimeter. And I think that's difficult for us. And uh, we've had conversations with US CENTCOM, we've had conversations with the US government, and obviously with the Israelis as well to try and come up with a solution to that. So it remains to something. Martin Griffiths, the ERC, put out a statement today on or yesterday on uh, the neutrality and perception issue. And we're trying to develop a paper which will try to give us 
operational clarity on how we need to work. Um, we've had a lot of uh, new developments from Israel. They've made um, a number of announcements in terms of how they how they wish to um, how they wish to open up things differently, different types of commitments. Um, we are, as the UN, committed to using all possible routes to scale up humanitarian assistance throughout Gaza. And but right now, we see that um, there've been a number of commitments made by Israel, um, a number of concessions. We would say things that we've been pushing for for months to try and get a better way into that. Um, we think it's, uh, it needs to be done in a way so we can get safely and timely as assistance into the people that need it. And we've, we've repeated the request for more openings. So what they've said is they're going to give us a, a coordination cell, which will be established uh, with humanitarians directly, including the IDF Southern Command. And then also um, the plans to open up ERES, as I mentioned, the, the assessment today, and have selected materials coming from Ashdod, which would be a simpler delivery from Ashdod directly into north of Gaza. And the idea would be to try and increase the number of trucks coming from Jordan through the Allenby Bridge towards Gaza. And the idea is to try and open up the two the two areas where the scanning's done, the Kerem Shalom and Nitzana, to have uh, much more operating hours, to have extended operating hours. We don't, at the moment, it's not open on a Saturday. And also the daylight hours are much longer now, so we should try and capitalise on those. And then there's also um, commitment to actually approve the Nawal Oz water line into North Gaza to get that restarted again from Israel. So these are the commitments out there, and we are working with the Israelis now to see if we can get that moved on so we can actually have a better performance and a better response to the crisis in Gaza. I'll stop there if that's okay, Jens. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for this very comprehensive uh, overview. And just on a, on a question uh, that was raised, uh, Mr. McGoldrick is speaking from uh, Jerusalem. Um, and we are looking at uh, providing you with, with a transcript uh, when that is available. Uh, I want to go to questions now. I want to see if there is in the room, and I have uh, Nina Larsen first from AFP and then Gabrielle from Reuters, and then I have a few on, online. So Nina first. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for taking the question and for and for this briefing. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, specific commitments you may have received from the, uh, the Israelis when it comes to resolving the difficulties uh, that you, the many difficulties that you mentioned around the deconfliction and um, around uh, getting getting aid through. Um, and I was um, I was wondering. In particular, if um, sorry, just a second. Um, yeah, sorry, that's that's it. <laughs> if you could just say a little bit more about that, thanks. So, sorry, could you say that specific? I, I didn't hear the, the 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 specific issue you asked for there. It was, it was to do with the commitments. Sorry, yeah, it was about actually. Actually, it was about the the communications. I was wondering about um, your the issue you mentioned about communications yeah. equipment lacking. Why why is that specifically that uh, that you don't have that equipment and uh, what is it you need to get it? Thank you. Okay, no problem. Shall we take the Reuters one as well first, and then I'll do the two together. Uh, right. no, normally we take them one one at a time. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, and it, we've been asking for a couple of things since day one uh, of the Israelis. One has been the fact that the deconfliction uh, system we have is not directly with the IDF. We go through CLA, which is a coordination uh, liaison administration office, and then we, we deal with COGAT. We don't deal directly with IDF. We need to be speaking to people who are firing guns, who control weaponry, and we have to build up an understanding from them and ourselves of how we work. The deconfliction system has been consistently um, inaccurate and it hasn't worked in our favour, to be honest with you. There have been so many incidents and we've been saying for a long time to the Israelis, warning them that there's, a, there's likely to be an incident that will come up, which is going to be quite a tragic one. And it happened uh, two weeks ago with the World Central Kitchens. We've said to them that the, the deconfliction system and the notification system are, are not fit for purpose. We have to find a way of reviewing and revising those 
And that's one thing. And then as part of that, in order for us to interface with military and when it's an emergency is underway, we have to have a hotline and the ability to speak to them. And in the case of any incidents we have, we cannot, if you're sitting in a car and you've been caught up in a firefight or there's bullets or something happening there, you have to relay that, that message back through your the, the office and then to CLA and then to IDF. And this is a long way around in the middle of a very, very hot emergency. That's the last thing you need is delays. And that communication problem was highlighted in the readout from the World Central Kitchens issue. So we've asked for communications equipment from the very beginning. We've given pages and pages to COGAT on the specifications, on the needs we have in terms of we need to have mobile networks. So we're 3G. We have to have... Um, you know, we have to have began SAT systems, we have to have handheld radios, VHF radios, all the things you'd have in any normal issue, a normal crisis. We don't have them. This the reason why uh, Israel gives us is the fact that they say to us that those communications equipment might fall into the hands of Hamas. And, and I, I, as far as I'm concerned, we, we have the ability to switch those off at a central source. So that, that's not an excuse for me. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel uh, Thank you very much for the briefing. Um, just a quick question regarding uh, COGAT figures about the number of trucks. I know there has been some disagreement in terms of how to count um, what aid is actually going through the crossings. Um, and COGAT is called the way of, the UN has counted as flawed. Um, what is your view on how um, on how these supplies are? Uh, are counted because according to what Kogat says, it's almost pre-war levels, which is not in fact the case. Thank you. Well, maybe just to say that pre-war levels were 500, 600 a day that were processed but not scanned. They're now being scanned. It's a much slower process. Um, I would say we used to get like 600 trucks in a day, but you should also remember in those days, probably about one third of those trucks, even less, were humanitarian. The rest were private sector. And so when they say there's more trucks now of humanitarian than before um, October the 7th, that's true. But we were not the bulk of the food, that, the bulk of the supplies that were coming in. So that side of their argument is, is, is questionable. The second thing I would say is that the numbers, I mean, they're using, for example, smaller trucks than we do. And then we bring the trucks into our side and we load them onto bigger trucks, trailer trucks and stuff like that. So we have less numbers of trucks going out. We also get trucks at the wrong time of the day for us to be able to offload, put on warehouses, reload and get out to Rafa because of the, the security and the timelines. And also I would, I would flag to you that all the trucks that come in and they mention the numbers, that all also includes large numbers of private sector. These are not all humanitarian, but we are responsible in their eyes for taking the, 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 humanita the, taking the, the private sector commercial trucks and uh, cargo into Gaza. So I would say that uh, there's, there's obviously, we have problems in terms of our ability to move stuff through qu uh, quickly and offload and reload again. It's a hostile environment. And as I said earlier, I don't think that, um, that, that you know, Israel can say that they give large numbers of trucks from Kerem Shalom and the Israel side into Gaza when it actually goes into the holding area where we have to process them, reload them and offload them and back again. And so I think that their responsibility, Israel, ends once the, it reaches the civilians of Gaza. So we should count the number of trucks we get to the north, the number of trucks we get out. And the reason why we, we don't get them out is because of the insecurity. The reason why we don't get them out to the north is because they don't approve the, the convoys that go north. There were, uh, again, two convoys set for this morning that were cancelled. There was a mission, another mission set for this morning as well and cancelled. So while the trucks come out in big numbers from uh, Kerem Shalom and Israel's praising itself for that, you also have to remember there are complications for us to logistically deal with it, but then more importantly, to actually secure our way out, and then lastly, to get permission to go out with those trucks to the north. Thank you, JB. We, we have one question from Japanese press, and then we will go to uh, Isabel uh, Saku from FA Online. Yes, thank you very much for doing it. Um, I have a question about the uh, coordination unit. Um, the uh, when actually will the coordination unit uh, as a direct contact with the um, the that with the southern commander will be established? Uh, if IDF indicated the timing of it, and then also you succeeded Miss Lynn Hastings, who who was denied a renewal of her visa in Israel, and I'm wondering, and and now you are. Uh, completing your uh, three-month mission, 
And I, wa I was wondering if this three months period is already agreed before, beforehand or you, this is a sort of three months period is unexpected, unexpectedly complete. And then who will be the, uh, the successor of your post? Thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll take the last question first. I mean, I, I was only ever meant to be here for a bridging period. Um, and that was to be around three months. It's almost four months since I've been here. Um, in that time, the, the UN system has been recruiting a, a replacement, the permanent re replacement. That's done as far as I know. And I hear that the Secretary General will make announcements shortly. I don't know when that would be, but I know it's imminent. Um, in terms of your question on the when this IDF sort of this coordination cell will be established. Um, we have a cell already right now, which includes CLA, COGA, and ourselves, the humanitarians. The, the missing part of it, as I've, as I mentioned, is the IDF. We were told that by, uh, by the general, the, the major general during the week, he will put one of his IDF members in there. I think that helps with the operational level of things. But I think we also have to have a higher level discussion on a regular basis with uh, Major General Finkelman and uh, my successor to make sure that some of the operational issues that are being addressed in the cell will also carry out and be come to fruition. So I think what we're looking for is a two level of that. And that's not something that uh, we've worked out yet, but we, we, we've seen the, and heard the commitment from the Major General and we're going to keep them to that uh, commitment and make sure we get that set up and running as soon as possible. And with that, to complement the use of a hotline and also to have better communications equipment inside Gaza. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, now, Isabel from uh, Spanish EFE and after that, uh, Nick Coming Bruce from New York Times. Over to you, Isabel. Yeah. Yes, hello. Good morning. Thank you very much. Isabel Sarko for uh, the Spanish News Agency. Um, my question is on, I, I have the impression uh, from what you have said uh, um, during your remarks that uh, the situation for the humanitarian have not improved uh, uh, in any terms after the incident of the of, uh, with the humanitarians of the World Central Kitchen. So could you I confirm this, uh, even if you have had this meeting with this general, that uh, the situation uh, remains the same. You mentioned a bullet uh, into a car uh, of UNICEF yesterday. Could you give some details? And if the situation doesn't really improve for the humanitarian uh, aid uh, coming into Gaza and being distributed to the civilians, what do you foresee will be the situation in the next weeks in in, inside the, the territory. Thank you. Thanks. I don't think there's been any uh, notable improvement in terms of our ability to move around. Certainly not our approval to get convoys going to the north. They've been blocked again today, as I said. Um, the incident you mentioned, uh, UNICEF, what happened was the mission had gone and was held at this at the checkpoint. At the checkpoint in the Saladin Road, there was, there's a holding area where the trucks and cars wait until they're given the green light to cross over. And in that time, I heard there was um, a shooting incident that took place. And as a result of that, um, there's a, a bit of a firefight between um, between the Israeli forces and another uh, person. I don't know who the other person was. But as a result of that, three bullets hit the UNICEF car. And luckily, no one was hit. Earlier in the week, there was also an incident with a WFP car as well, which a vehicle which was caught up in a firefight as well. So um, while the World Central Kitchen issue has, has happened and it's a tragic incident, and uh, there's been a lot of, um, you know, a lot of reports back from the Israelis about miscalculations, about mistakes, about these things. I think it just brings into stark focus how unpredictable the system that we use for our own protection and safety is not working. And I think it's something we have to continue to ask for improvements. And that meeting this week with the Major General Finkelman at the IDF Southern Command was exactly for that purpose. And along with um, ICRC and the US Humanitarian Envoy, we pressed the point that we have to have a system that allows us to be to be safe and to be protected. And that's the responsibility of Israel as we operate in the territory that they occupy. Thank you. Over to uh, Nick, New York Times. Thank you, Joe. Um, thank you, actually. Yeah, um, Isabel pretty much asked the question I was going to ask. But, I mean, it seemed to me that in the last two weeks, net, net, um, nothing has significantly changed. And there may be a little bit more supplies coming in but the system is still the same, and the, the none of the concessions that seem to have been 
mooted uh, after the world central kitchen uh, crisis um, seem to have been operationalized. Uh, I, do you have any timeline for getting uh, supplies in from Ashdod Port and opening the area's crossing? Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, no, to be honest with you, we see the big numbers that Israel announced of coming out of Kerem Shalom, but that doesn't mean they then get delivered inside, as I mentioned earlier, some of the complications that we have to face and the fact that we don't get convoys to the north on a regular enough basis. Those are uh, the working environment that we're in. Uh, the concessions we made were very welcome. I think there's something we've been asking for a long time um, from the Israelis, and they, after the tragic incident of World Central Kitchens, have taken it upon themselves to make the announcements. All we can do is keep pressing them for that. I mean, we were supposed to do, uh, I was supposed to do a recce this morning to the Erez crossing and to the Ashdod and the Zakim crossing, but that mission was cancelled because of insecurity. So we will continue to remind um, the, the Israelis of what we want from them, what we need from them, in order for us to make the humanitarian situation better. And that means complicity with them. It means working with them to open up the Ashdod, to open up uh, the, the areas or whatever crossing in the north, to hopefully get Carney back on as well. And at the same time, have the three routes which are in the south to the north are opened up and functioning. And it's not the case at the moment. Uh, so all we can do is keep reminding them and using the pressure from key member states to to remind uh, Israel of the commitments they've made and the commitments that we've been asking for for such a long time. It's not something that's, that's come as a surprise to us. It's something we've been pushing for from day one. And they've now seen it's necessary to start considering those. I would also caution the fact that um, when they talk about Ashdod to Erez, they've also used the word temporarily. And uh, there's a worry is that it's only for a short period of time and then they'll close it down again. That would be an essential lifeline into the north because that's where the population, according to the IPC, the recent famine committee report, that is where the bulk of people who are the most danger of slipping into famine. And that's why we wanted the, the Ashdod port opened up into Gaza directly. And that's why we were hoping for the floating pier that would have been more northerly uh, based uh, in order to address the issues in Gaza City and the north part where the, the bulk of the population are. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I have Isabel Sacco from EFE uh, with the hand up again. Uh, so back to you, Isabel. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was uh, I had a second part of my, of my question that uh, you 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 didn't understand. And it was about uh, what do you foresee as the situation in the next weeks if the um, if the access, access of the humanitarian aid um, doesn't improve, uh, given the situation of of famine in the north and uh, the situation also in, in the south of uh, Gaza. And I could uh, maybe uh, take the opportunity also to ask, uh, did, did you have any um, exchange with the, um, this Major General about the, the plans of Israel that has made public to make an incursion in, into Rafa? Uh, and did, they, did you discuss this with, with him? Thank you. Thank you. Um, on the the weeks ahead, if we don't, it's not so much what they've told us in terms of concessions. And if, if in the weeks ahead, if we don't have um, the chance to expand the delivery of aid into all parts of Gaza, but in particular to the north, then we're going to face a catastrophe. And um, the people up there are living such a fra fragile and pre precarious existence. We've had very, we've had eight convoys to the north using the military road over the last month. There's been very intermittent commercial traffic has gone up the coast road. It's not enough to satisfy the needs which are there, and they're massive. And we can see by the the health situation, we can see by the the sort of uh, the nutritional, the the way that children are starting to show real serious signs of malnutrition. And the fact that the IPC Famine Committee report highlighted that 70% 70, 70 of the population up there were in real danger of slipping into famine. So we, we need to see a change in that, but we haven't seen that happening. And we hope that the announcements are made. We can hold them to those words and we can open up more pipelines and more entry points to the north and elsewhere to get more roads oper operational, to get more supplies in. And it remains to be seen, but right now there's been no visible difference in the, the changes that we've seen on the ground. And I think Israel knows that uh, we're in a very precarious position and the, Israel knows that they have to be seen to be much more permissive towards what we're trying to achieve as a humanitarian. 
Um, in terms of uh, the, the RAFA planning, uh, it came up in the meeting in the sense that we we flagged it. I flagged it as an issue that we were concerned about, but clearly we were not going to get into discussion on the actual military aspect of it. We know politically we've heard people saying it's imminent and others saying it's not imminent. We saw that um, there was a, a, a differentiation of, of words from, for example, Prime Minister Netanyahu versus what uh, Prime Minister, what uh, Defence Minister Gallant said. So I don't think there's really a clear way forward. We have been insisting since day one, though, a couple of things. One, we would we would require um, time to be able to prepare and pre sort of prelocate or uh, have in place where people might move to supplies. We can't do that right now because we don't have enough supplies coming in on a regular basis. We're barely able to feed the people and support the people currently. And if you were to add on another dimension of that contingency planning process for a RAFA incursion, we are nowhere near ready for that. If you, we cannot pre-position material we don't have. And if people are looking for water and sanitation at a time of real, real problems in terms of weather and the shelter issue, as well as our food supply issue, and then the health system is no longer functioning. As part of our own planning, we've set up uh, emergency medical um, field hospitals uh, all the way up the north at the, the middle part of Gaza. And that would be then to try and accommodate if the Gaza, if the Rafa Gaza gets locked into some sort of military incursion and we can't operate from there. The health system itself is in really bad shape, as you know. There's only 10 out of the 35 hospitals that are working and barely two thirds of the primary healthcare centers are no longer working either. So we face a real dramatic uh, situation ahead of us. And if there was to be a RAFA incursion, I know the figures that they're, they're mentioning of evacuating some 800,000 from RAFA, there is no space in, as we see it right now in Al Mawasa or anywhere else on the coast where you can accommodate that number because there's 400,000 plus people already there. So we are in you know, an advocacy mode to say this shouldn't happen. And we're also at the same time ringing the alarm bells that we're nowhere near ready if we had to address the needs. We will not be part of any um, helping that the people move, will not be part of any evacuation, but we have to stand ready if we can to support them when they do re arrive at another destination. Some people having been displaced for five or six times already. Thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, I'm just looking in the room and online and I don't see any more questions. Uh, so I think we can we can wrap it up here. But as this is probably the last time we see you in in this capacity, I just want to to thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for your transparency and your availability uh, for the press in this very important job. Uh, and then perhaps give you uh, the last word uh, that that we want to tell the media on this occasion. Yeah. Over to yeah. you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for that. Thanks for the opportunity of telling uh, people, you know, what the situation is. We know that the international media is not present inside Gaza, and it's important that we as humanitarians bring the stories and the issues out so that people can see for themselves and hear for themselves. Um, sadly, that's not easy. Um, we face a lot of challenges on the ground uh, to, to serve the population there. I think we have to flag the fact that, you know, national staff are working for organisations like UNRWA and other INGOs. They, they are really struggling in the sense that they, they've been affected themselves by the crisis, they've lost loved ones, their family, the livelihoods have gone and passed them. And now yet they come up to work every single day, working hard to support other fellow uh, Gazans. And I think we have to admire that approach, that resilience. And that's where the hope is. I mean, Gaza has been through a lot of crises in the past, nothing anywhere close to this one on its massive. And so we, we then have to we have to find a way to be better able to support them, better able to give them a chance and give them some positivity. And I would also just to thank all of the, the, the humanitarian workers currently under real serious challenges in the Gaza context. And they come to work every day and they put their head down and just go on with it. And for me, it's a, it was a real honour to be part of that. So thanks, Jens. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for, for those words. I'm sure they are appreciated uh, in Gaza and, and elsewhere. So with that, we will end this press conference. Thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.